regret, remorse, pages and pages of life wasted and gone. But your story isn't finished yet. There's still time for edits and cuts. But before you start doing the right things, sometimes you need to stop doing the wrong things. My story, I decided to stop. I started a little bit with you last, last week was actually incredible and awesome to see, what the, to see these lives change and to see something change right before your very eyes is absolutely incredible. It, it kind of reminds me of, remember how uh, we used to go to uh, uh, Teddy's restaurant and we'd take our straws and we would crunch it all up together and then we'd sit it down on the table and then we'd take our coke and we'd just get a little bit of our coke and our straws and we'd sit it down on top of that little straw paper and you'd watch it change like a worm right before your very eyes. It was amazing because it happened Right then, it's equal as amazing to see people's lives change. I mean, right before your very eyes, and you can just see God just moving in people's lives, and you just, I mean, the expression on their faces, and it tells it all. But sometimes, we are extremely good at being fake. That we can come to church, and, and, and we'll smile, or we might go to work, and, and we'll smile, or we may go visit our, our in-laws, or... Our family get together, and whatever it is, and we'll put a smile on the face. And then, I don't know if you heard uh, Garrett and Sarah's video after they left, but they used to fight to the church, and they put a smile on. And as soon as they left, and I love in that video, Sarah, she said, and we just pick right back up where we left off. <laughs> Too many times we're fake. And I think a lot of times we give off the impression that we're better off than what we really think we are. And we give this impression of fake. So last week was all about this one word. Y'all remember what that one word was? One word surrender about surrender, that we are completely different because we're going to surrender our lives. And I don't know how your week has been, but whenever me and the man first surrendered our life to Christ, I'll never forget this, that was on a Wednesday. On Wednesday. Then the next day on Thursday, we were having spaghetti, and we're sitting at this little, this little bitty table. They had their kitchen table, and I had these two chairs, and we were sitting there, and we both were just looking at our food. And uh, Amanda said, should we pray? And... Uh, I, I guess, and so we mumbled out a few words, and I could not tell you at all what we said, but that was the first recognition that something was completely different in our lives. That as we surrender to God, we come across these little things like, wait a minute, I might not need to do that anymore. Or I, I, need, to do, I need to do this. It really started getting our attention whenever we started watching movies in our DVD collection. And it's just like, we'd watch these movies, and it'd be so funny, but at the same time, it'd be like, it sounded almost like somebody's running their fingernails down the chalkboard. It's just like, I, I'm, I'm going to change this. I, I, don't, I don't like this. And so we, we deject that and we put something else in. And sometimes we go through two or three, like, you know what? Let's just get rid of them all. And then finally we just end up, let's just sit in the dark. These little changes. I did not mean anything by that, so you can all, all, all that stuff on your own. So last week we were talking about this surrender now, and there's this man in the Bible who had the exact same problem. Uh, his name was Paul. Uh, before his name was Saul, he was living a story, and he was like going down this narrow path. And he was living a story that was unbelievably amazing, and the story that he was living was telling people and kind of against God. But he thought beyond a shadow of doubt that he was doing everything right. And there's a whole lot of Bible and a whole lot of Scripture going on with that. So I want you to watch this video, and this will kind of show you a little bit better about what his life is like. So just check this out. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for the cooperation and the arrest of the followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. 
fell down, blind, and he heard a voice. speechless. Jesus intervened. Saul was led by hand into Damascus. He remained blind and did not eat for three days. Jesus intervened. Jesus called upon Ananias. Ananias was hesitant. Jesus intervened. Ananias finally met Saul. He healed Saul's blindness and Saul became Paul. All because Jesus intervened. This kind of amazing story about this guy named Saul, who later I say, became known as Paul. So they kind of give you a brief summary about what his life was about. He was doing what he thought was God's perfect will. Killing Christians. He would take them. And he would have them put into prison, and sometimes he'd be standing right by them, right, right there as they were stoning these people. And his life dramatically changed because now instead of going out and grabbing these Christians and having them killed, he was now a Christian himself. And so then he started going talking to the people that he was working with to cut off these Christians. And then guess what happened? He got put in jail. He was put in prison because he was preaching and teaching about Jesus. He would go to people's houses and while they was working and while they was traveling, he would tell people, hey, do you know about Jesus? He, he was this man and he came, he lived, and he died and he rose again. He rose from the dead. And in that, he's standing on trial in front of this king named King Agrippa. He's standing on trial. And he has to give an account of his story. Now, this is where I want to pick this up. This is in Acts chapter 26. So I want you to follow with me here because he is telling a king his story. Now, I don't know about you in the story that you're living, but right now, I'm living the story that I want to tell. And right now, he is having to stand before a king and give an explanation for why he's doing what he's doing. And he's completely the opposite. He was way over here, and now he's over here, and he's standing before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. And he's standing right before the king, and he's beginning to tell him his story. Now, this is in the the HCSB, and it's up here on the screen too, but I, I want to read this, and this is 11 verses, but I, I, want, I want you to see this. So this begins with verse 1, Acts chapter 26, and this is King Agrippa. So Agrippa said to Paul, it is permitted for you to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. Verse 2, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that today I am going to make a defense before you about everything I am accused of by the Jews, especially since you are an expert in all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Verse 4. All the Jews know the way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation in Jerusalem. They had previously known me for quite some time. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our religion. I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand on trial for the hope of the promise made by our God to our fathers. Verse 7, the promise our twelve tribes hope to obtain as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why is it considered incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself suppose it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus and Nazarene. And here's what I want you to listen, verse 10. I actually did this in Jerusalem. I locked up many of the saints in prison since I have received authority for that from the chief priest when they were put to death. I cast my vote against them. In verse 11, in all the synagogues, that means churches, so in all these churches, all these worship places, I often try to make them blaspheme by punishing them. I even pursued them to foreign cities since I was greatly enraged at them. And he's telling this story to King Agrippa. And he kind of pauses it right here. Because he's telling this extreme story. Completely unreal. It's like I was living this one way, and then he met Jesus, and he got completely this other way. So in this story right here, what he's telling him, and he's in, he's in prison now for teaching people about Jesus, but his story is nothing mentioned about Jesus at all. As a matter of fact, his story right now was talking about how evil he was. How 
against God, how against Jesus he was. And so what he would do is he would go everywhere. He would go to the churches. He would go anywhere he possibly could. And he would drag them out and have them killed. Put into prison whatever he could possibly do. Now isn't that same kind of extreme? And that's what his life was about. And now he's standing before King Agrippa and he's telling this very story. So it got me thinking, okay, what they would normally do, a normal, a normal way of death at that time would have been stoning. Now this is not about little kids when you throw rocks at each other. This is a little different. This is actually stoning to the point of death to where you would be killed. Killed. Now, so I got this idea like, okay, well, if I, I'm going to stone somebody, here's a little rock. I, I picked this up from the driveway, a little bitty rock. Now, if there was somebody I was wanting to kill with a rock, I would probably not choose this rock. This would probably not hurt that bad. Uh, it's just a little bitty, little, little bit gravel. Probably wouldn't hurt, you know, too off the bat. But they would hurl these rocks and they would actually throw at somebody. So it would probably take a whole lot of these to do some damage to somebody. So I'm thinking, okay, my, if I was going to stone somebody, I'm going to choose a rock, you know. Um, I really like this because it's, it's almost the size of a baseball one. Man, I could really hurl at this and do some damage to somebody. Now, how would you like that if somebody was throwing these rocks at you? Now, this, I think, is something that would be really serious. This would be really serious. At one point, you know what they would do? They would take the person who's being accused outside the city wall, and they would go on top of the wall, and would take the big stones and these big boulders, and they would actually even push them off on top of somebody. And here's this guy named Saul... And that's what he's doing. He's taking real rocks. And I mean, hurling them at somebody. And they would die. Doesn't that seem extreme? To the point of death. I mean, stoning. I mean, this is... So I'd like to have a volunteer. And what I would like for you to do is I want you to stand here, or you can get down on your knees, and I'm going to hurl these three rocks at you. <laughs> Tristan raised his hand, but I don't, he's laughing. I don't think you're going to do that. <laughs> Who would be my first volunteer to do that? Mom would. Right here. Now, Mom. I would probably get somebody to go for it for this one, right? Yeah. I'd probably get to go for that one. As a matter of fact, I could hurl this at John right now, and he'd probably kick And that, that would be no big deal. But when you start getting into these things, why would you be reluctant to do that? It's going to hurt. It is going to hurt. Man, and if you hit somebody between the eyes, I think they're going to fall over, okay? I, I, I really think they will. Now, I've never been hit in the head with a rock like this size. Now, me and John did throw a lot of rocks at each other. We even had slingshots in there. But it was nothing like this, okay? This would hurt. This is deadly. When you would gather a group together of anywhere from 10 to 20 people around somebody and all hurling these rocks, somebody's going to die. And King Agrippa is saying, listen, that's what he's telling you. He's listen, I pursued them. I would go to these foreign cities. I would go and I would grab these people together. I would make accusations against them. And I would stand there. There's this one man named Stephen. That's what happened to him in the Bible. And this guy named Saul that we're talking about, you know what he did? He held all the coats. He held all the coats of all the people that was throwing rocks. Have you, have you seen those in movies when somebody's getting ready to get their fight on? And they'll, they'll take their jacket off and they'll be like, here, hold this. Or they'll throw it to the side. So here's Paul standing bold and proud, and he's holding the coats of these people. And watch them as these stones are being thrown at them and they're dying. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And then something happened. It was in that video that I showed you just a minute ago. He stopped. See, he, he was going along this one way, this, this one road, and he, and he stopped dead in his tracks. <coughs> he stopped. And in all these, these videos that we showed this, uh, this past week, you know, something stopped. And right here, here's Paul's story. He's going on, he's explaining to everybody here that's listening, to the king and everybody else that's listening, he said, listen, here's what happened, and then it, it stopped. Paul's story stopped here. And that's the first thing I want you to understand about this today, is that Paul's story, it stopped. He's going along life, doing everything the way he's supposed to, and then bam, it stops. And I can say the same thing for my life. But here I was, I was going this one way of life, and all of a sudden, it just stopped, and I went a completely different direction. 
I bet some of y'all have done that with your careers, haven't you? Maybe you thought you was going to be a truck driver working for a city your whole life. He's going this way, and then like, no, I'm going this way. I don't, I don't want to go down this road. I'm going to go down this way. So that story stopped. And then right here, Paul's story stopped. And he's standing before the king, and he begins to explain about his story. Now, this is kind of, a, I think it's absolutely amazing because it's a completely and totally different story. His story stopped, and his life ever changed because of this right here. And this is why I want to read, share with you. This, is going to be, this right here is what's life changing. This picks up in verse 12. And I want you to read this with me. Because what he's going to do, he's going to tell the king and everybody else listening his story. Now before I read this, I want you to understand something. You have a story. Every one of you, right here in this room, you have a story. It may not be the story you want to tell, but you have a story. And whether you want to tell it or not, it's being told. Somewhere, it's being told. Because you can't pretend to be one thing in your closet or in your home and be something else out there. It's going to come known. You are living some story right now. And you have a story to tell. And Apostle Paul, he's telling his story to King Agrippa. Like, Listen, this is the way I was. Now maybe you're at this point in life that the story that maybe you're living or maybe you're caught up in or maybe in your past that you're not very proud of. Or maybe you don't like it at all. Listen, Apostle, he had a change of heart. Listen to this, because this is, this is amazing. He says in verse 12, he says, I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and commission from the chief priest. He was going on his way to go kill some other people, kill some other Christians. Verse 13, King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick, kick against the goat. Then I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen, and what I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them. Verse 18. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That by faith in me they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified. And here's what gets good. Verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preach to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. Verse 21, For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. To this very day I have attained the help that comes from God and I stand to testify both small and great saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place. Verse 23, that the Messiah must suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he will proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. Now, I know this is a whole lot of scripture that I read to you here this morning. But there's a reason for that. Because in his life right now, he has seen a completely and totally dramatic lifestyle change. He said, King Agrippa, I was living this one way, I was going in this direction. I was going to kill people and I would have them killed and I would gather up these rocks and I would hurl them at these people. I was casting these stones. And I had permission to do this. I had full authority to do this. It's not that I was out here doing anything law breaking. I wasn't breaking anybody's laws. The Roman citizens, the Roman police, they wasn't coming out to get me. I wasn't breaking the speed limit. I was doing exactly what I had authority to do. And I would take these stones and I would throw them at these people. But then on that road, as I was going, I met Jesus. And Jesus stopped me dead in my tracks. And as I was going this way, He sent me on a completely different direction. And He's telling these people, He's telling King Agrippa His story. And He says, and now, and now King Agrippa, I am teaching and preaching this hope that's in Jesus. And then He goes on and explains to now the Jews, they're, they're the reason that I'm here. They're the reason that I'm on trial because they have heard me teach and preach about Jesus. I was a stone thrower. Now, 
I am a hope giver. And the cast of him in the prison. And he's telling the story. Isn't this a dramatic change? In his story? See, he was going this one way. And then he stopped. And went a completely different direction. He stopped. He stopped. All those stories that we watched last week, those My Story videos, they all had one common thing in, in with them. They were one way and then stopped. And stopped. And if you pay attention to Monique's and her videos, she's going on about how I think it was kind of just amazing, just one thing after another, and finally you're just completely and totally far away from God. And she said, I knew I needed to get my life like I knew I needed God. So she made a decision to stop one way and start another way. Many times in our life we have to stop something before we can keep on going the way that we want to. Now, my brother doesn't know that I was going to ask for him, but I was going to ask him to come up here. So come here, John. John is always using my guinea pig. Uh, so here's John. So here's John. John represents my past. He represents a road that I was heading on down. Now here's the, all the times what we try to do is that we, are, we will lock arms. We will lock arms. And we'll say, here's who I was. Here's your, and here's what I we say, okay, I'm going to make a decision. Last week was about the story that I, I'm going to start. I'm going to start living. I'm going to start doing right. I'm going to start living right. I'm going to be nice to my parents. I'm going to be nice to my kids. I'm going to do everything that's right. I'm going to do what is right. And so we'll start taking it off, except our story stays behind here. And so here we are, and we're trying to go, and we're trying, we're trying to do what God wants us to do, but we're latched on. Because what we're trying to do is live in this area that we have made in our minds called this great area. Like, oh, I can still be a Christian and, and still be this. I, I still can't. But then we're trying to go. And he said, but we're locked in. And we can't do it. And we will never, ever do all that God has for us to do as long as we're holding on to that past. Still kind of doing what we've always done. Guys, if you keep doing in your life what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. If you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. And I don't know about you, but in my past back here, you know what's back there? A mess. It's a mess. I don't want that. And sometimes what we've got to do, we've got to stop this before we can let go to be over here to where God wants us to be. So here's Paul. He says, here, here's what I was. Here's my past. I met Jesus and I stopped it. It's done. Completely let go. And now I'm free to roam and do what Jesus wants me to do. I have completely and totally let go of the past. And he's standing before King Agrippa and he says, King Agrippa, this is what I was. But this is what I am now. Something stopped. It stopped. And I'm not that man anymore. Thanks, John. I don't know about you. But in all those stories, and as you see these stories in the Bible, you see one common thing. One common thing. Something stops. It stops. It's, it just stops. And before we can go on, we got to stop this so we can cross over to do this. You cannot do it. Think of it this way. Whenever you're, you may be growing up and you may be dating people and all that, you stop dating whenever you meet the right one and you're wanting to go on through marriage. Now, once you cross over to marriage, you don't come back over here and date again, right? <laughs> right? Right? In marriage, that's completely, totally blatantly obvious, right? That we don't do that, right? Well, why do we think we can do it and get by with other things in our life? See, sometimes we have to stop friendships. I'm not talking about befriending somebody, but sometimes we've got to break relationships. We've got to break those so that we can be over here and be free to do what God wants us to do. It's the same thing as an alcoholic saying, you know what, I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit, but never ever taking the initiative to stop so they can be over here and say, you know what, I'm alcohol free. People who's addicted to, uh, to nicotine and cigarettes, they're, 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 they're the same way. I, I can do this, I can quit. I'm, I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit. But until they make the, the sign to stop, they can never be over here and say, you know what? 
I've been smoke free for 11 years. Do you stop? Stop. I see this in New Year's every time. Somebody says, I'm making a news revelation, uh, news revelation, a news resolution. <laughs> I'm going to lose weight. I'm saying no to sweets. And that breaks my heart because I love cake. So to say no to sweets, I'm going to say no to this. I'm going to start exercise. I'm going to say no to this. And I'm going to start this. But the problem is, is they got one foot here and one foot here. And like, I'm going to exercise. You know what? I'm going to exercise for two hours a day. I'm going to eat this cake. I'm trying to justify their actions. They're holding on to both worlds. God, it does not work that way. And Apostle Paul said, listen, I was completely this way. And now I'm this way. I stopped being that guy. I met Jesus and I stopped being that guy. I stopped. <coughs> and when I completely stopped, Jesus completely and totally changed me and made me brand new. Now, Apostle Paul had, he had a choice here to make. That is, was he going to stop? Now, Jesus stopped him dead in his tracks. But he followed on through with it. He told him later on exactly what to, what to do. And he done it. He stopped. He gets confused when we're trying to do too many things at the same time. Because usually what we end up doing is making a mess of things. Uh, this is why I can only read one book at a time. There's some people who can read three to four books at a time. My sister's one of those who's gifted that she can read multiples. I can't. I have to read one book at a time. Because if not, I read this one book, like I'll be reading The Hobbit, and then it'll get confused with Harry Potter over here. And I'm like, wait a minute. The Hobbit and Harry Potter are like, but where's the brooms at? And I'm living over here, and I'm like, well, wait, that's over this story. The stories, they intertwine, they mix. I'm like, I'm a mess. You know what? I just got to quit. I'm going to do one. I'm going to do one. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do one. For some reason, men can do this pretty good at watching TV. We can. We can flip through the channels and watch three football games and know what's going on on another show all at the same time. We can do that. We can be watching this one game when the kid with the score and it'll, it'll go to Mercy and like, flip it over. Check the score. Wow. Now, and you keep it up, you know what's going on. Now, I know, I know that with, with my wife, it's different like that. She's like, stop! <laughs> Leave it on one channel. I don't care if it's watching football, whatever. Just leave it alone. And I'll be flipping back and forth. So men have a little bit different thing. But when it comes to books, I can't do that. One thing. If, if I'm watching TV, if I'm watching TV, I will not be worth talking to. One thing. I'm watching TV. Now, I know you've heard me say this many times. I'm watching TV. If you want me to talk to you, you have to cut the thing off. Because I, I'm in. I'm hearing you talking. I'm saying, yeah. Huh? What'd you say? When he goes to a commercial, I'm all yours. As soon as it comes back on, I'll be trying to look so hard to look at you, but it's like for some reason this something grabs hold of my head and it's a gravitational pull and I'm going. They got that. <laughs> <laughs> no creative tears, no blood, we're all good. So there's this gravitational pull that goes towards this. We only do one thing at a time and do it good. And so if you want me to be engaged in your conversation, I want to stop this so I can start this. At work, it's the same thing. I cannot be typing out an email and be talking on the phone. I have to do one thing or another. Stop and start something else. So in our lives, and in your lives, and in your story right now that you're living, I do not know what that looks like. I don't know what it is that you're going through. But I do know this. Apostle Paul was living one way and he thought he was doing right. He thought he was doing God's will by taking those Christians. Because see, he didn't believe that God could raise somebody from the dead. But that one fact changed his whole entire life. Because he met the person who was raised from the dead. He met Jesus. And it changed him forever. And I'm looking around at you guys and thinking, wow, these are some very good looking people. Very good looking people. They look like, it looks like everything in your house is in order. You know what? As clean and neat as what you all look like, I bet I can go to your house. Your kitchen is going to be clean. Your dishes are going to be done. I bet your bed is even made up. Now I'm seeing laughter. You don't know very well. <laughs> Guys, that's it. See, we can put this whole facade on in front of everybody that everything is together. I bet you can't find my missing dish towels. We need to study up this dish towels. We'll take it to the nation. 
what I'm trying to get at is, is that what you might be appearing to give off and what you really are could be two completely different things. In your life right now, is there something that needs to be stopped? But see, I decided to stop living one way so that I can live another. And in your life right now, maybe you're doing this whole cross between holding on to two things. Maybe some of you are holding on to one part of you and trying to be over here into another. I, I know I know I need to step over here. I know I need to. I like the way this is over here. I, I like this. <coughs> Is there something in your life that you need to stop? Is there a story that you need to stop in your life? There's this one movie, uh, and I love it uh, for some reason. It's called uh, Big Daddy. Uh, there's this uh, actor in there. His name is uh, Adam Sandler. And uh, me and uh, my cousin Justin, we would watch this movie, and it was like one of our favorite movies. And we come to this one part, and they had this guy called Crazy Eyes that he would come down this uh, this park, and he was in a, in a buggy, and uh, there's a hey. You know, you better slow down. And he said, you should want me to slice up the muffin. And he's got these crazy eyes and stuff going on. And uh, he runs into a pole. And uh, when he runs to the pole and he comes across, he's like, you all right? And he kind of says this weird thing after. And he, he goes something like, Jimmy Buss, see us. <laughs> and that's what he says. And I have no idea what he says. But for some reason, me and my cousin thought it was so funny that we would rewind that and play it again. And we would rewind that and we'd play it again. And we would, sometimes we'd spend 30 minutes rewinding that and horse laughing and playing it again because it was so funny. We loved that. But sometimes in our lives, we do the same thing. We're holding on back this back here. Then, man, if I could just get back to here in my life, if I could just do this, if we could just be like this right here, and you're trying to live that over and over and over again, but your life thing is going on over here. See, it's great when we can have these mental replays and we can we can go back and we can replay that all. But sometimes we've got to stop living right here in the past and we can step over to here where we're at right now. Maybe it's something in your past. That maybe this back here is where you are. Maybe sometime in your life, I mean you messed up. I mean you just messed up bad. I'm gonna tell you something. You are not that person. It's in the past. And maybe you've got to let go of the past so you can step over the life that Jesus has for you. You're not that person. Stop that story. Stop playing a rewind. Stop living back here and step over to this new life, this new story that God has for you. Is there a story in your life that you need to stop? Yeah. Is there one? Because many can be all kinds of different things. See, we want you to fully surrender to God, but like I had John up here, been my past, and we can't fully surrender to God when we're, when we're holding on back to here. It doesn't work that way. We've got to let go and say, you know what? I'm not going to be that person. I'm not. Maybe what you need to stop is the excuses. We can make excuses. You know one thing that we often do to, to, to get past this or to hold on to the past? Instead of us stepping up and doing what we need to do, you know what we do? We'll blame other people. Instead of accepting them full responsibility, we say, you know what? It's my fault. I shouldn't have done that. We start blaming somebody else. It was his fault. It's your fault for the fight last night. It's your fault that the kids are the way they are. It's your fault because the house ain't clean. We start making all these excuses. And sometimes we want to stop the excuses so we can be over here and do what we need to do. This story will need to stop. I don't know what your story is. But maybe right now in your life, if there is something in your life that you need to stop, you need to stop. When we found out that we were pregnant with our fourth, our fourth child, uh, and I was sharing the news with the people that I worked with, they're like, wow, uh, don't you think you need to stop? People say this because if you don't have any more kids, there's something you need to kind of stop doing or do other things to stop. And it seems kind of blatant, obviously, right? To stop. And things like that are always really easy. We can stop that. I'm talking about the things that are private in your life. The things that nobody sees. That you think, oh, it's okay. Nobody's going to find out about it. It's all good. My heart got broken. Uh, this would have been uh, Friday. We was visiting with our in-laws. We was watching this, this TV show. It's about these medical emergencies inside this hospital and this trauma center. And they were getting ready to do this surgery on somebody. And the anesthesiologist 
collapsed on the floor. And on that TV show, they said he was a code blue. He was unresponsive. Unresponsive. So they, they put these masks on him and they got him to a bed and they were trying to, to work on him. And they noticed over here in his left arm was these holes and blood was coming from him. Later when they finally got him resuscitated and he was responsive, they started asking him questions. And he said, I didn't ask for any of this medical help. I didn't ask for any of it. So I, I'm free to go. And he's like, no, you have questions, Angie, because you're in our care. And come to find out that the anesthesiologist was addicted to drugs. And in there in that in that operating room, he was inject he injected the wrong needle in his arm. Instead of the one for pain, it was the one to knock you out. And he collapsed on the floor. No telling how many years he had been doing that, but he kept everything he had where nobody else could see. And many times in our lives, the stories that we're living is a story that nobody else sees. Is there something in your life that maybe nobody else sees that you need to stop? So you can start living the story, not only that you want to tell, but that you want to share. Because guys, I'm telling you, we all have secrets. We all have areas in our life that we don't let people into. Whether it be skeletons in your closet. Could you imagine Apostle Paul going up to his grandkids someday and saying, you know what? Y'all play with these rocks and hit them. I used to hurl these at Christians. And they would die right there in front of you. You can imagine that wouldn't be a very pleasant story. But Apostle Paul, he stopped with the mystery. He picked up a new one. There's a story of Jesus and his plan for him. Is there something in your life that you need to stop? I don't know what you're playing around with. I don't know who you're playing around with. I don't know what you're doing, but you need to stop living one story. So you can fully surrender and say, God, here I am. I want to live the story that you've got for me. If he can change, if he can change Paul, man, he can change any of us. Because I've not seen a single person here throw rocks at somebody. Now, maybe you're doing it verbally. Maybe that's what you need to stop. Maybe you need to stop being so mean to people, the people that you work with. Maybe you ought to put your kind of stones to truth roll. Maybe, maybe with your kids, maybe you need to, yeah, the expression, maybe cut the cord. Maybe you need to let them go. I don't know what that is in your life. But maybe you need to give your, maybe you need to give your kids some, some breathing room so that they can live the story that they're supposed to tell. And they can't do that when you're breathing down on top of their necks. Maybe the story you need to do, you need to live, is to take full responsibility of who you are. And say, you know what? I know I'm a mess, but Lord Jesus, you can have me anyway. That was my prayer to all the way. When I fully surrendered my Christ and I was down on my knees, I said, God, I am a mess. And if you can make something of this mess, then I will gladly give you my life. So he's taking my mess. And you're all seeing some of the fruits of that. If he can do that for me, if he can stop the story in your life, then stop playing rewind. So you can start living the story that you want to tell, that he has for you. So my question to you is this, and it's kind of simple. Is there something in your life that you need to stop? Stop. Now, I'm not, we're not preaching on alcohol, we're not preaching on anything like that. But until you decide to stop it, it's going to keep playing. The other night, me and May was watching a bad movie. Uh, just turn it on. It had been playing just a couple of minutes. And I said, you know what? I don't like this movie. So you know what we did? We stopped it. We stopped another movie. And the second movie was so much better than that first one. We was only a couple of minutes into that first one, but we stopped it. Some of us would be too lazy to stop the movie we didn't want to watch it. In your life right now, don't be too lazy to stop it. Stop it. So you can start living the story that you want to tell, that you want to share. Stop. So my question this is simple. What do you need to stop? What is it in your life right now that you need to stop? So you can start living the story that you want to tell. I'm going to ask you to lay in close your eyes for a minute. We're coming, so we're coming to a close. It's kind of awesome what God's got going on in our lives. 
later on you can read about Apostle Paul, this man who hurled these stones and killed these people. He started churches. He led numerous people to Christ. All because of the story he decided to stop. So my question to you is this morning, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, this is your challenge time. This is your time to start thinking about God. Because we can get caught up in the church. We can get caught up in what we do the once a month. We can get caught up in that. But this right here is what's that. Right now in your life, what you're doing. See, maybe, maybe, maybe your house, maybe things ain't so good. Maybe there's a lot of arguments going on. Maybe there's maybe you're playing the blame game. Well, today be the day you say, you know what? I'm gonna stop playing and get blame game. I'm gonna stop. Maybe you need to stop something with your kids. Because for me, right now, what's quiet? I want you to talk to God and say, God, I need to stop. And you fill in the blank. What is it you need to stop? Right now, it's coming face to face with you and it hits you right between the eyes and you know, you know you need to stop it. Maybe you need, you've known you need to stop it for years. And right now is the time, right now is the moment that you can stop it. Would you give that to God right now? Would you say, God, this is what I need to stop? So I want you to call him God and say, God, I need to stop. And you fill in the blank. I need to stop this. Because I want to live a story that I want to tell. God, I want to live a story that you have for me. I don't want to blame people. I don't want to argue. I want to be the story. I want to live a story that you want me to live. I need to stop this. Maybe there's more than one thing. Apostle Paul was one thing. Maybe you have a cup. Maybe you say, you know what? I need to stop living in the past. I need to stop blaming people. I need to stop blaming my kids. I need to stop this. And you feel Father God, as we think about what's going on in our lives, we can think several things that we need to stop. But God, I can't help but think that right here, right now, that you've got something very vivid in our hearts and in our lives that we need to stop so that we can start living the story that you have for us to live. That we need to let go of who we were so that we can step into the newness of who we are now. As you continue to pray, I would love to have the opportunity to pray for you because it's hard. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. This is between you and God. I just want to be able to pray for you. There's a story that you need to stop. You prayed up prayer this, this morning. You said, God, I need to stop this. And you're asking for his help. You're asking for his in, in, intervention. Just like you did with Paul. I'm going to pray for you. Would you just sit up your hand and say, that, that was me. I, I prayed that prayer. There's a story that I need to stop. Hands are going up. It was others. I need to stop. Just raise your hand up and say, yep, that's me. I got a story. I need to stop. Father God, I pray for all these that have raised their hand. God, that they have something in their life that they need to stop. Good or bad, regardless, God, we want to stop so that we can start living the story that we want to tell. God, I pray today it would be life-changing. It would be liberating. That we would be free from this past. We would be free from these things that hold us down and hold us back. That we can start living the story that, that God, we want to tell. That you've got for us. And God, you dramatically changed Paul. And God, all we know is you can dramatically change us. So God, I pray for these this morning that decide to stop that you do something incredible in our lives. As you continue to pray, there's one more question that I want to ask. And before you can start stopping and start living the story you need to tell, maybe you need to surrender it all to God. Surrender. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all. I surrender all. Would that be your prayer today? Say, you know what, Lord Jesus, I surrender it all. Living my story, I surrender it all unto you. Would you pray that prayer right now and say, Lord Jesus, here's my life. Take me and make me brand new. Forgive me of my faults. Forgive me of my failures. I accept Jesus as my son, as my Savior. Lord Jesus, take me and make me brand new. Thank you for new life.
now you have mine. In Jesus' name. Father God, as we come to close here today, I just ask that you're grateful with that. That the story that we tell, that it would be one that we would want to tell and that we could share with others. God, you're an awesome, amazing God. And may we never forget, God, what you're doing in our lives. And I pray today, God, as we're talking about the my story, my story, that every one of us can be bold and say, you know what, I have a story, and God is the author. He's the one who's moving in our lives. God, I pray for everyone that's here, that today is the day that we remember, as that we stop living one story and start living another. Father God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.